morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us here at High Hill Christian Church online campus. We're glad you're here. If you want to go ahead and get connected with us, go to our website at highhillchristianchurch.org slash church online. Fill out a connection card there and we'll be in touch with you. Go ahead, have a seat, get comfortable and enjoy the service. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to High Hill Christian Church. We are the connecting place where it is our purpose and passion to connect with God, to connect with others and connect others with God. Uh, this week, it is our pleasure to be joined by Kara Whitehouse Quad. Um, but right now, if, if you're new with us on Facebook, YouTube or our website, uh, we just want to make you feel welcome. Our staff and our elders are uh, ready and available uh, to fellowship with you and pray with you. Uh, but right now, let's get to a place where uh, distractions are few and we can focus solely on the awesome uh, love, grace, mercy, commission, and power of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as we enter into our time of worship today.
Welcome to High Hill Christian Church. Welcome to those of you who've joined us here at the High Hill campus. If you're joining us at the online campus, welcome to you. And welcome to all of you who are joining us today from the Girls Town campus. Well, we're wrapping up our series called Next Level. And if you've been with us the last four t- weeks, we've been talking about taking our faith to the next level by growing in Christ. And in week one, Joe talked about how we have to die to ourselves. In order to follow Jesus, it's going to cost us something. We have to give up our preferences and our comfort, and we have to take up our cross daily and follow him. And in week two, Joe talked about how we have to take off our mask. We have to be vulnerable with other born-again Christians. If we actually want to grow in Christ, if we really want to go to the next level, We have to be honest with what's happening in our lives. We have to take the mask off and stop faking it. In week three, Joe talked about how we have to throw off the yoke of unforgiveness and begin to deal with the broken relationships that are in our lives. If we want to go to the next level with Christ, we cannot be harboring unforgiveness in our heart. And last week, Joe talked about trusting God with our gifts and our talents and our resources so that we can give it away and allow God to multiply it. And when we give it away, when we give away what we're learning, when we give away what God is doing in our life, he uses that to bring hope and encouragement to those around us. And we're able to help other born-again Christians take their faith to the next level. But we're going to wrap up our series and our conversation about taking our faith to the next level by asking this question, who is my one? Now, if you've been here over the last few years or if you're connected in family ministry, you might have heard that question before. We talk about this an awful lot in family ministry and and we've said it a little bit from this stage, but the question is really simple. Who is my one? So now that you know what the end question is, what we're going to be dealing with today, who is my one, I guess we're going to need to start, though, with a different question, which you might be thinking, which is, what is a one? And in order to answer that, we're going to need to turn to Matthew chapter 28. So if you're here at the High Hill campus, go ahead and grab your Bible. If you don't have one, there's one underneath your seat, or you can open up uh, your Bible app. But we're going to be in Matthew chapter 28, and we're going to start in verse 19. And I'm sure many of you have heard this passage. It's probably pretty familiar to you. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, if you've heard this before or it sounds familiar to you, you might have heard it called the Great Commission. A commission is like an instruction or duty that Jesus gave his disciples right before he went to heaven. And this is the final instruction that Jesus gives his disciples. But it's also the final instruction that Jesus gives to us as born-again Christians. It's actually the instructions he's giving to the church. Go into every nation, baptize them, and teach them to live a life that honors him. And the, the instruction, it's not really that complicated, but it can be a little overwhelming for a few reasons. We'll start with the biggest one, the phrase, all the nations. I mean, really? There are 195 sovereign nations in the world, and, and we have to go reach all of them? And not, not only that, this word that's translated here as nations is actually the Greek word ethnos, And it isn't talking about nations at all. It's actually talking about a race or a people group. So if you think that it's a little overwhelming with 165 nations, there's actually 16,543 people groups on the earth. And if that's not overwhelming enough, there's 7.8 billion individual people. 
So if I'm supposed to make disciples of all nations, and there's 195 sovereign nations that make up the world, and that's made up of 16,543 different people groups, made up of 7.8 billion individual people, and the average person only lives to be about 79 years old, and there's 2.4 billion Christians in the world, then that means each of us has to disciple 68 million people in our lifetime, which, which can seem really overwhelming. So, so why even bother trying? I mean, that's what we pay the pastor for anyway, right? But what if we started with just one? What if instead of being overwhelmed and giving up before we start, we started with one? The truth is, if only 10% of our church would actually do what Jesus commissioned the church to do, then 13 new people would give their life to Christ this year. Did you hear that? 13 people would give their life to Christ this year. Not 13 people would start coming to our church. 13 new born-again Christians. See, the commission isn't about inviting your friend. That's good, and and that's important, because when you invite someone to church, it can help them get connected with God. But the mission is for you, your friend, your coworker, your family member. You are to tell them about Jesus. Not the pastor, not their connection group leader. You, as a born-again Christian, are called to individually Share the gospel with other people. And when we do that, 13 people get to step from death to life. 13 people will have their life radically change with the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And what is that good news? Well, turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says this, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That's the good news. That's the gospel. It's that simple. Christ died for our sins. And, and what are sins? Sins are when, when we do something that goes against God's law. So raise your hand if you've ever sinned. Yeah, me too. So we've messed up, we've disobeyed, we've sinned, and the Bible says that because of that sin, because we've messed up, we deserve death. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, the wage or the payment or the penalty that we deserve is death. We deserve to die because we have disobeyed. But Jesus Christ died for our sins, just like the Bible says. And after he died, he was buried in a tomb. And we're going to talk about that in great detail in our next series, Famous Last Words, that starts next week. But Christ died for our sins and was buried. He didn't just die. He rose again three days later, just like the Bible says. He rose from the dead so that we, too, can rise from the dead. See, when we accept Christ, the Bible says we have to put to death our old self. We have to die. Joe talked about this a few weeks ago. We have to deny ourselves and take up our cross daily. We have to crucify our flesh with its passions and desires. Romans 8, 11 talks about this new life in Christ. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. See, salvation doesn't come when we die. When someone gets saved, it's not a one-time experience. It's not a prayer We pray and then we get dunked. Salvation is an ongoing, daily process. You can't just get saved and be done. It's a process. If you made Jesus Lord of your life 50 years ago or five months ago or five minutes ago, you aren't done. You're not good to go. 
Salvation is a daily process of dying to ourselves, killing the sin in our life, working to not keep making the same mistakes again, and then letting the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you, if you're a born-again Christian, raise you up to a new life every single day. It's taking your faith to that next level. So Jesus rose again so that we could have a new life daily through the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the good news. That's the gospel. I I think maybe we should practice it all together. What do you think? I I know that might sound kind of hokey, uh, but oftentimes we make this really way too complicated. We think that we have to have all these scriptures memorized, and we have to have a degree in the Bible. And let me just tell you, I do have a degree in the Bible, and I'm not any more saved than you. My knowledge might be greater than most, but I'm still daily crucifying my sin and letting the Holy Spirit raise me up every day and empower me to live a new life in Christ. So let's practice it all together. We're going to practice sharing the good news. We're going to practice sharing the gospel. Here we go. Repeat after me. I've sinned. I've broken God's law. Jesus died for my sin. He paid the debt, the penalty. He took the punishment I deserve for my sin. He was buried and rose again. So that through the Holy Spirit, I can live a life that honors Christ. Good job. See, you just you just shared the gospel. So so let's review. A one is someone who needs to know the gospel or the good news. And even though we've messed up or we've sinned, Jesus died and rose so that I can live a life that honors him. That is the gospel. So we know what a one is and we know what they need. So I ask you again, who is my one? Who is your one? See, the church is called to go into all the world and make disciples. That's called the Great Commission. It's what God calls the church to do. And the church is not a building. It's a group of born-again Christians. And that's what God is calling each one of us to do. It's our mission. So how do we go about finding our one? How do I know who my one is? Well, to figure that out, we need to not look at the commission that God has given us, but the commandment that God gives to us. And we read that in Matthew when Jesus is asked this question, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And in Matthew chapter uh, 37, or chapter 22, verse 37, he responds with this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So when we ask, who is my one? We have to ask, who is my neighbor? That's an easy question to answer. It's literally anyone. Your neighbor could be your actual neighbor, the person who lives next to you, or it could be a coworker, or a family member, or a friend. All of those people are our neighbors. So if our mission is to make disciples, to share the good news with the world, and we talked about starting with just one, and that one is my neighbor or any living, breathing person who needs to know and understand and feel and experience the love of Jesus Christ that is so extravagant, that love that would die for me, that would die for you, then the question is, who is that person in your life? Who do I know that needs to know Jesus? Who is my one? Well, I'll tell you, my one is named Mike. But who is your one? Now, let me give a few clarifying statements because there are a few things you might be tempted to say in this moment. You might be thinking, oh, well, my one is blank. Uh, or, oh, yeah, but it's also, it's also blank. And, and also, oh, yeah, I probably need to also uh, pick blank, right? And, and that's great because, remember, the whole mission 
is the whole world, but I want to challenge you not to pick a bunch of ones. I want to challenge you to pick just one. Once your current one starts a relationship with Jesus, then you get to pick a new one. Let's not make it complicated. Let's not get overwhelmed. Let's start with just one. So we have the commission, go into all the world, and we have the commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. But you might be wondering, how do I actually reach my one? You know what the gospel is, and you know how to share it because you just did it with me a few minutes ago. But you might not be confident enough to just walk up to your one and tell them that. So how do I reach my one? Well, to answer that, we're going to look at John 13, 34. It says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. You might be thinking, oh, another commandment? Well, n- not exactly. See, the verse says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. But if you look all throughout the Old Testament which was the scriptures up to the point when Jesus says this, you'll find the commandment to love one another is all over the Bible. So the new commandment is not to love one another. Remember, we've already talked about the fact that we're supposed to love our neighbor. And when Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, he's quoting Old Testament scripture. So it's well known that we're called to love one another. But what Jesus is saying, this right here is the great compulsion. And a compulsion is an irresistible idea or an irresistible urge to behave in a certain way. So if the idea that we have that we should love one another is found all throughout Scripture, then the compulsion part of this verse, the compulsion part that Jesus is saying is, as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. See, the love that Jesus gave us is eternity shaping. It's overwhelming. It's miracle working. And it comes in and it transforms us from the inside out. And if we say that we love Jesus, then that love that he has shown to us, that love compels us to share it. The love Jesus showed us should fill us so much that we can't contain it. Let me show you what I mean. So this is us, right? And then this is the love of Jesus. And when we are filled with this love of Jesus, we are overwhelmed and we are compelled to share it because their love is so great we cannot contain it inside of us. This new command is to love like Jesus loved. And we've seen what God's love looks like in flesh and blood. And as recipients of that love, we are to become participants in his love. That abundant life that Jesus promises us comes from this love. And we find that in John 10, 10. It says this thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I come so that you may have life And have it abundantly. That abundant life comes from the love of Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever shall believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. So if you're a born again Christian. Then you know the mission. It's to make disciples of all the world. You know the commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. And all your strength and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. And now you know the great compulsion. The love that Jesus poured out on us is so great that when it fills us up, it has to pour out of us onto those around us. And when we talk about this idea of the one, we ask a few simple questions. And each one of these questions is tied to either the commission, the commandment, or the compulsion. So here they are. Question one, who are you praying for? This is the commandment. It's a really simple exercise. 
A great preacher I was listening to the other day was talking about this idea of praying for one. His name is Bo Chancy, and he actually wrote a book called Pray for One. But, I, but I'm not going to make you read the book because it, it's really this simple. You just pray like this. God, give me one person to share your love with today. God, give me one person to share your love with today. Let, let, let's try it all together. Just We're going to pray this prayer together. Close your eyes, and we're going to pray this prayer together. God, give me one person to share your love with today. And there's a good chance that as you prayed that, God might have put a name or a face in your mind. And guess what? That's the Holy Spirit. He's working inside of you. Write that name down. So the first question is in response to the great command. Who are you praying for? And when you answer that question, you know who your one is. The second question we ask is, how am I caring for them this week? This is the great compulsion. How am I showing them this overflowing, extravagant, crazy love of Jesus this week? And the final question is, how am I sharing my story with them this week? This is the great commission. How are you sharing the gospel with your one? How are you sharing what God is doing in your life with your one? So here's the hard question. Who is your one? Because the hard truth is this. If we say that we love Jesus, but we're okay with our co-worker dying and going to hell, do we really love him or do we just kind of like him? If we say that we love Jesus and we're okay with members of our family dying and going to hell, do we really love him or do we just kind of like him? If we say that we love Jesus, but we're okay with the person sitting next to us right now dying and going to hell, if we are okay with our friends dying and going to hell, if we're okay with our marriage falling apart, if we're okay with our family ministry being understaffed, if we're okay with our community that we live in, the neighborhood that we walk through, through being filled with people who are desperate and dying and going to hell, and we have the love of Jesus inside of you, then I ask you again, do you really love him, or do you just kind of like him? Because the love of Jesus is too great, it is too powerful, it is too overwhelming for you to contain, it is too overwhelming for you to keep inside of you, it has to come out. So do you really love him, or do you just kind of like him? Maybe you aren't sure. Maybe you don't know, and, and that's okay. We're here to help. As we get ready to respond to God's word today, you'll have an opportunity to come up here and talk to someone if you're here at the High Hill campus, or you can type in the chat if you're joining us at the online question, and, and we can answer that question for you. And you can know for sure that you love him. And you can recommit today and say, I'm going to pour his love out to those around me. Or, or you can say, maybe for the first time ever, I love you, Jesus. I want you to be Lord of my life. I surrender to you today. But maybe you already love Jesus and you're already trying to pour out his love to those around you. But the task, it seems so overwhelming. There are so many people. So I ask you again, who is your one? Because in a moment, you're going to have an opportunity to ask God who he wants your one to be. And then you're going to come down the front and you're going to take one of these Sharpies and you're going to write the name of your one on this giant one. Not because writing the name does anything special, but it's a reminder and an encouragement to you to pray for and care for and share your story with your one this week. Whatever God is saying to you right now, he's calling you to respond to him in some way. And so as we stand and sing, my prayer is that the love of God that he has poured out onto you will pour out onto other people around you. That it will be hard to go to hell this week in our community because you are praying for, caring for, and sharing your story this week.
So who is your one? God, give me one person this week to share your love with. I'm sorry for not taking seriously your mission to share your love with those around me. Put people in my path this week. Put people in my path today so that I can share your love with them. Holy Spirit, move through our church, move through our homes, move through our community so that everywhere we go, the name of Jesus may be glorified. We're praying for our ones today. Give us opportunities to pray for them. Give us opportunities to care for them. Give us opportunities to share what you're doing in our lives. Give us opportunities to share your good news with our one this week. We ask for boldness, God. We ask for opportunities and we ask for your love to pour out in our lives so that we can pour it out to others in the name of Jesus.
Jesus said in John 5, 24, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life. We begin the communion with a piece of unleavened bread, representing the crucified body of Jesus. Unleavened means made without yeast, which is a living organism. The bread has no life in it. If you have your bread, take it with me. The fruit of the vine, however, whether it's grape juice or wine, is very much alive. It also contains yeast, and if you doubt that the grape juice has yeast in it, try some that sat out for two or three days. It doesn't take long to ferment. The law of Moses in Leviticus 17.11 tells that the life is in the blood. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. And so as the communion shifts from lifeless bread to living wine, we see part of the symbolism. The Lord's Supper is about moving from death to life, remembering that through Jesus we died to our worldly, earthly selves in order to live anew as righteous spiritual beings. But although God sees us as sinless in His grace, we really aren't, are we? We need this weekly reminder that we are supposed to be that a truly awful price was paid to make our new lives possible and that we live in Christ only because of his death. As we take this holy drink, let us recommit ourselves to living as Jesus lived, to dying to the world and living in new and holiness. If you have your juice, take it with me now. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you now, remembering this holy sacrifice that you set apart for us. As Jesus took this last supper with his disciples, he said, do this in remembrance of me. And we do that today, Father. We thank you so much for your grace and your mercy through Jesus. We thank you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen. In just a few minutes, we are going to receive an offering, and I'm going to invite you to give. So while our volunteers are getting ready for that, I wanted to share a quick thought. Are you a movie fan? I'm a huge movie fan. Have you ever stayed all the way to the end of the movie credits and just watched all those names scroll by hundreds and hundreds of people doing all kinds of things to make the movie happen a few starts might get the name on the poster but it's really all these people that work that made it happen i watched the credits of star wars the other day and saw these roles producer director second unit director animator set designer photographers Driver's grip, key grip, animal trainer, hair designer, government liaison, assistant accountant, cater manager, and chief textile artist. I know what you're thinking. The chief textile artist really made that last Star Wars movie? But seriously, so many people involved in making a movie. People you may not know and roles you didn't know were needed. So many people in the credits. Church is also like that. There are so many people involved in this entire operation, from people on the stage to people working with kids, people helping during the week, people inviting their friends to people who give money. If you're involved in any way, we wish we could roll the credits. What you do really matters. We couldn't do it without you. If you give financially here, we're very grateful. Seriously, thank you so much. If you're already given online, thank you. You can give online by visiting highhillchristianchurch.org slash give. You can also mail a check to 852 Boone Slick Road, High Hill, Missouri, 63350. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessing of this church. Thank you for all of those who serve, those who prepare, those who lead, those who give. 
We pray that you multiply our offerings today. Multiply our time so that our ones can experience your love. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.